Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of K-Fade. We are back with episode 13, I believe. Um, yeah, long way. Long way we've been going. Um, we've, I believe we put out two episodes last week. Three episodes last week, I believe. We had the AEW Revolution review. We had our regular weekly show. And then we had the special uh, discussion with Eugene. So, three episodes, that was a lot for one week. But this week, we'll only have one. We're only going to have one episode, which is a review of things, of uh, the shows. <clears throat> Something to my chest. Um, man, that hurt. Um, so we're going to have just a regular weeks of reviewing. Um, there's not much to discuss this week for WWE, other than NXT. A lot of stuff about, Im- uh, some stuff about Impact, a lot of stuff about AEW, um, nothing for around our squared circle review this week has been kind of hectic for me uh it's school and all uh, we were about to hit our spring break so i was really focused on doing some school work and like i said the only two shows that i will catch religiously are AEW and nxt so you know if i don't catch any other shows i'll watch um those for sure um, although i've not been caught up with monday night raw or smackdown for weeks so, I believe since the Elimination Chamber. Um, I watch like maybe clips or so every so often, but I don't really catch up as much as I should. Um, I will be able to watch Fastlane this weekend, though. So, as soon as I watch that, I'll probably shoot out some sort of review um, for that pay-per-view, considering WrestleMania is right around the corner. And then um, we'll catch up on Monday Night Raw, just be for the road to WrestleMania. I think we only literally have, like, what, close to three weeks left. Not even a month left before we hit it. So, yeah, um, we've done really good with our Spotify debut. Um, we got three episodes out from the first week of us being on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I have yet to get us on Google Play. It's crossed my mind, uh, and I have not yet been able to do that. So I'm going to get it on as soon as possible. I have to just remind myself to do it. Hopefully you have some time this weekend. Hopefully sometime next week. I will be on spring break next week, so I'll be able to catch the shows and stuff. Uh, we will have more special episodes. This is kind of a little bit of a preview before I get on to the regular show. We will have um, special episodes, you know, like the history of, or, you know, we'll have Eugene back on the podcast at some point. Um, but as of right now, we're just going to stick with the reviews for the next maybe week and a half or so. Um, I plan on doing something the week before WrestleMania. It's not going to probably be WrestleMania themed, but it will be like a history of or something. You know, if you're familiar with Dark Side of the Ring or... If you watch uh, Wrestle with Andy on YouTube, his documentary style kind of thing, go more into depth. Anyway, so, not a lot to cover this week. Like I said, very slow little week other than AEW's crazy show. Um, we're going to get right into it, though. So, if you know, we're gonna, or usually you know if you're familiar with this show, we do the Round the Squared Circle bit. Then we get into reviewing of the show. And then we kind of just go from there. But this week we don't really have anything from around the square from around the squared circle segment. Um, if we only thing I do have is Eric Bischoff was um, Eric Bischoff was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame this week, which comes as a surprise for many considering he's been on he's been some sort of an AEW figure on and off. So you know I guess this showcases that WWE doesn't really have a vendetta or grudge against people. Not sticking with WWE, considering Eric Bischoff is more or less not a WWE prominent figure, but you know he's a very big rival and such. So kind of a big news for that. Anyway, let's get right into the wrestling shows. Uh, won't be very long an episode this week. Do you talk about politics? No, I do not. This is a wrestling podcast. I do not talk about politics. So um, can you meow? This is the weirdest. <laughs> no. Uh, if you don't know, we're live on Twitch when we put these out beforehand. So I'm usually live like Thursday night, and then um, we will be live, or I will upload upl- upl- the audio versions Friday morning. <laughs> so we get comments here and there. Not a lot, though. I don't, again, I don't talk about politics. I don't think I've ever have on this show. Um, quick little update. Because NXT is moving to Tuesdays, um, we will be able to... Um, upload a day earlier so usually i do this thursday nights just because with AEW and nxt being the same night it's a little bit harder to really um how would you say it's a little bit harder to put out the episode right after watching four hours of wrestling just because 
I don't feel exhausted, but you know, by the time I'm done watching it, it's already super late at night, and I'm like, oh, I don't really feel like doing it. So I usually do it Thursday night because you know, I feel a little bit pumped. I'll have my notes ready, give me a day to gather my notes. But I feel like with NXT, if it does move, end up moving to Tuesday night, which it does seem very likely is going to happen, you know, I'll be able to watch AEW at like five o'clock, hopefully live. Be watching it later on during the show, and then gather my notes for like another hour or two, because it usually doesn't take me long to gather my notes. Usually, only takes me like maybe the longest it's ever taken me to gather my notes has been half an hour. So you know, after watching all these shows, we can finally do a Wednesday night, at least uploaded by Thursday, which is what I originally wanted to do. But again, because WWE and NXT, NXT and AEW are back and forth, it's a little bit harder to um, it's a little bit harder to upload and the podcast so um i don't talk about politics because this is a wrestling podcast not politic podcast <laughs> you're looking at the wrong podcast buddy anyway let's get right into it so aew dark elevation the debut of their new aew show um so if you're not familiar so if you don't know what this is about so there's already an aew dark this is an aew dark evaluate uh, elevation so what this show is meant to do it's meant to literally elevate uh, talent that AEW has and is building up and kind of put them towards, you know, more of the indie circuit uh, people just to give them a little bit more spotlight. Um, this was kind of the original idea that the original AEW Dark had, which was to give AEW wrestlers who didn't get time on TV a chance to be able to perform and showcase their skills. So this is kind of an adaptation of that. It includes Tony Schiavone and Paul White, aka The Big Show, on commentary. And it also features stars like Jungle Boy, um, Miro, and Kip Sabian, or, you know, Tay Conti, Rio. And the, the, overall, this was for the debut show, it's pretty good. Did not expect it to be, excuse me, two hours long. Um, usually, I don't watch AEW Dark because they're just a bunch of, like, squash matches. I've never really seen or heard of, like, AEW Dark having really well matches, you know, if... if if I'm bored, and I don't want to. If I don't really want to watch anything, I'll put on dark and just kind of have it playing in the background. But it's not really something I follow, just because there's I don't know. AEW has so much stuff going on, especially you have to be caught up with like the BTE and all these other storylines. Just feel like it's 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 very much a lot for an average rest an average wrestling fan to watch. I mean, look at me. I, I only I only watch NXT and I haven't really caught up on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown. I mean, I have an idea what's happening, but there's just so much wrestling. You know, I can really only take in some at a time anyway so the first match how i did this review basically was i just wrote down some of the stuff on the cards and or all the matches on the card i didn't really have much to say for everything but you know you'll get the gist of it so anyway aw dark evaluation debuts on march 17 2021 the first match was jungle boy versus limelight this is the youtube debut again for aw dark elevation um jungle boy is a very talented athlete We've seen him um, wrestle the likes of MJF, and you've seen him, you know, on Dynamite. And you know, he's 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 really he's really well over, really good talent. He's one of my favorite technical wrestlers. Um, I wish they would do more of him. I just I'm I was constantly I'm constantly tired of seeing him having these big matches and stuff. You know, for example, on AEW Revolution, when he had the tag, when he was in the tag team battle royale, Casino Royale, and he was one of the last two standing. Um, against Ray Phoenix. I was really hoping he would get the win and you know as much as Luchasaurus also has work to be done I feel like Jungle Boy is already you know at a really well a uh, really well level to the point where they can kind of push him But not give him such a big spotlight But really get him more familiar with the audience just because he is going to be a bigger star one day And you know seeing the likes of him and what he does now It's it's very obvious that AEW has big plans for Jungle Boy And obviously you might have to wait a little longer for him to see him and really see him branch out But I'm very happy that you know an AEW bred talent is um, getting the spotlight, which we'll get more into, by the way, about AEW bred talent and how you really work people and how you really, you know, showcase the people that you yourself have bred and made a well-known name. Anyway, um, it seems like Paul White, aka The Big Show, was only doing color commentary from what I was gathering, although I'm sure he made an announcement that he was only going to be doing color commentary. He's pretty good at it, you know, he's, he's not just sitting there calling out the moves. He, he added, he was... Pretty interesting to listen, go back and forth with Tony and explain why he watches the wrestlers. He actually makes this really well comment. He says, and this is after the match, by the way. He says, um, if you learn the ability to emotionally connect with the audience, um, that's how you become a star. 
um, because you want the audience to basically connect with you, and you want to be able to tell stories not only outside of the ring, but inside of the ring, you know, while most people are there for the storytelling aspect of wrestling, you could have good charisma, and you could, it, it goes both ways, you could have great charisma, and you could have this great wrestling personality, but if you're terrible in the ring, it's not going to get you much, um, and, you know, vice versa, it goes both ways, you know, if you're really good in the ring, and, you know, you do really great, and you're one of the really well wrestlers, but you have no charisma, it, it fails to draw towards an audience, and when Big Show made that comment, I was like, you know what, it makes sense that he says that, because, it, I believe we talked about this in the, the, the Fight in Wrestling World episode with Eugene, you want to be able to connect with the audience, not only through the storytelling, but once you get to the actual and physical match, between you and your opponent and you've told this story outside of the ring and then you get to tell this story inside of the ring why while it doesn't make much sense how you would tell a story inside of the ring once you really get into the aspect and this is where commentary really plays a big play in wrestling because they help you know visually and audibly explain the story to the viewer um it makes the audience i guess feel for the wrestler and it what gets you interested in the wrestler. So let's first say, for example, Johnny Gargano versus Adam Cole when NXT TakeOver happened. The audience was super behind Adam Cole, but Johnny Gargano was able to tell a story in the ring, which was his underdog story, and get the audience to cheer him on and to boo Adam Cole. So when you do something like that and you know how to connect with the audience and you know how to get the audience to go behind you, which is something WWE does struggle with, you know, back then when they struggled with having Roman Reigns be a face of WWE and now obviously he is one of the biggest faces in WWE it's um it's something that's a little difficult to do but you also have to play it smart you don't want to overwork you don't want to I guess over um overshow I guess or you know very showcase have you don't want to how would I say this you don't want to overdo it Basically, you don't want to give them too much exposure. You want to basically give them enough to where you bring them back. But also, every time they see you, they're like, man, I really want to see what kind of story this guy can tell. Or I want to see what else this this guy can do. And, you know, there's a lot of examples that I can't really think of in the top of my head right now. But it's something that you definitely should think about when watching wrestling. <sighs> um, so, basically, uh, back to the match. Jungle Boy does win by submission. I like the idea that Dark Elevation is more of a show to help build future talent with the likes of Jungle Boy, Miro, Matt Sedell, um, and just basically just don't give any talent work. So when the reason why Dark is so long is because Tony Khan wants to give people work. Regardless if you're from the indie circuit and you're not signed of AEW, you're going to get paid and you're going to get to work. And that's why Tony Khan does not let people leave the wrestlers leave and, and you know tapes all this stuff is because he knows the pandemic how hard it is to get a, a booked on the show right now and he wants you to get the work done um and dark elevation is different you know we're actually getting AEW talent you know people we're familiar with um on this show and kind of build and hone their skills similar to how nxt would work except you know instead of telling a story they're mainly just building their talent or building their you know skill set um Elevation seems like they use their current big talent as well as, as more big known in order to hone their skills. Again, what I just said. Anyway, so the second matchup on the card, I didn't write any notes for this down, was Miro and Kip Sabian with Penelope Ford versus Baron Black and Vary and Vary Morales. And then the following segment after that match was the QT Marshall interview. So if you've paid attention to Revolution in the past uh, Dynamite, uh, obviously QT Marshall is having trouble with the Nightmare family as he spat in the face of Dustin Rhodes, um, and, you know, he's in the Nightmare family. So QT is asked about his involvement in the Nightmare family and promises there is nothing wrong with them. Um, the third match is Big Swole versus Skylar Moore. This makes Big Swole's in-ring uh, return after battling Kron's disease since January. Um, it wasn't much said what she was, uh, how she got it or... Um, you know, how she dealt with it, but, you know, it, it was one of the things that people were confused about considering the last time I believe we saw her was during Full Gear, during, I think it was the Brit, no, sorry, it wasn't Full Gear, <sighs> Double or Nothing, I believe, when, um, 
she had that whole feud with Britt Baker. So it's been a minute since we've been able, we've actually seen Big Swole, um in the ring. She hasn't really done much, and people were hoping that she would be in the AEW Eliminators tournament, but obviously she wasn't able to just because of that disease. Um, the fourth one is Marco Stunt versus QT Marshall. At this point, I believe Marco Stunt has become a glorified jobber just because of his size. QT Marshall completely bullies Marco throughout the match, doing some incredible flips and tricks with Marco, literally throwing him up and down, uppercutting him, spinning him around, and doing backbreakers. It's insane. So the fifth match on the card was Tay Conti with negative one versus actually Vox. Tay Conti is one of my favorite wrestlers in the AEW. She has a very unique move set compared to what you see with most women uh, wrestlers. I was upset when NXT had let her go because she really didn't get to do anything with them beforehand. And I'm glad AEW was giving her more of a chance, um, allowing her to work with herself. So if you're not familiar with Tay Conti, she is a black belt in mixed martial arts. And I believe she studied jujitsu. She studied a bunch of stuff, and she has she uses this all into her move set. Um, her style, I would say, is a little bit similar to that of Kyle O'Reilly, just because he uses some of his martial arts background and uh, connects it with his move set. So she's really interesting to see in her in the ring. She has her own th uh, three amigos, which is three arm drags, and then I believe it. She, she puts it into an arm bar. I'm, I'm not familiar how it is, but like I said, it's her ability to adapt and ability to add more to her character. While she hasn't really quite found herself as a character just yet, she obviously has the moveset and she's obviously really talented. Um, I really enjoy seeing her and in, in her ring work. Um, I'm hoping they put her more of a spotlight on her in, on Dynamite. She's been on there a few times, but now with Anna J out of um, competition... You know, she's obviously not going to be going around anywhere. Um, I believe the last we've seen her was she was offered a contract by the Dark Order. Um, but she hasn't really seemed to be on the side, although she keeps following negative, round, negative one around a lot. Um, yeah, she's just overall a really good talent and someone I'd really like to watch. I don't really skip any of her matches. Um, I really enjoy seeing her wrestle. She's she's um, really good. If you haven't seen her, she's, she was on NXT for quite a bit, like I said. And even then, you know, she, she was a jobber, but she was still pretty good. And I know she had quite a following during her house shows um, working with NXT. Um, so Negative One is obviously outside the ring. He's seen his reactions are kind of funny. He keeps throwing himself around the ring and around the ground. It seemed like she really wants to go in the ring. He was So Negative One was literally throwing himself around and about um, the ring. You know, he's only, I believe, nine years old. So, you know, seeing this, you kind of forget he's nine years old. You know, he, he's, he's, I guess he knows what the business is and he knows what wrestling is just because of his father. Um, but, you know, seeing him, like, take bumps when it ever Tay or Ashley would take bumps and, you know, have it like, basically bounce on the, on the mat, he would do the same thing. And I feel like he's like, oh, he's eager to get into the ring. He's eager to get in there. Um, Tay wins the match and negative one throws the ref's hands off Tay instead trying to raise her hand. Um, I don't know, this kid's kind of funny, um, and it's surprising that how involved in AEW he is. Um, I know he's not really much of a leader in the sense of the Dark Order, but he's there just, you know, he's enjoying himself, and he knows, I guess, his mom, his mother is that, you know, it's a privilege for him to be on AEW, and he knows that, and he's having f the most fun he can with it. Um, let's see here, so the sixth match was the Sido Brothers versus Jarrell Nelson and Royce Isaacs. Really extra, extra extra tidbit here. I had no idea that Matt Siddell was Evan Bourne from WWE when he debuted on AEW. He looked super different. Um, still has the same move set, but Jesus Christ, he looks so he looks like a fucking hipster. Like he's completely changed his character. Um, segment B: Powerhouse Hobbs inter Hobbs interview. This is the first time I think I've ever heard uh, Hobbs cut a promo without the likes of Team Taz. Uh, anyone from the Bay Area immediately will get a following from me. Um, Powerhouse Pobs is someone I would keep my eye on regardless. Same, go same, go same gone for Shotzi Blackheart because she's from Oakland. Um, Powerhouse pa Hobbs is from Palo Alto. I've heard him a little bit on Chris Jericho's podcast and his, and his upbringing and how he got into wrestling. It's very interesting where he came from um, and hearing him grow up from the Bay Area. Um... 
I, you know, he's he was very much praised in his early beginnings and when he first started debuting on AEW Dynamite. So now seeing him, you know, along the likes with Ricky Starks and Brian Cage and T and Taz, it's interesting. Um, I was I'm really hoping that he gets his really bigger moment to shine and he's not just part of this group that has I guess um, you know this following to it you know Taz is a recognizable face and having this group will help give them all the recognition but I feel like Hobbs is just there to be there you know he's not he hasn't really done much since joining Team Taz and I want him to kind of branch out and be his own star you know you don't you don't need to have a faction to be your own star you know once you're placed in a proper um, set and you're placed in a proper booking you know, you could become a star, and I feel like Hobbs does have the power to do that, and he has the will, I guess, willpower to do that, no pun intended, um, and I'm, I guess, you know, while he still has some areas to work on, and being with Taz obviously will help him out, no doubt, I'm really excited to see what he does in the future, and I definitely could see him as a future AEW World Champion, um, but yeah, that's why I'm glad they had this show, it's more to develop their talent, and I'm glad to see him that he's able to really do what he's, um, good at doing seven match is danny jordan versus red velvet um she, obviously we've seen red velvet beforehand she had a nice showing against shaquille o'neal and jade she can really do well in the ring the following segment was sidell brothers cutting a promo backstage kenny Ar Ar omega interrupts the sidell brothers and says that matt sidell has to beat michael nakazawa and if he does beat him later tonight that he would get a shot at the AEW world championship or he would get a shot at Kenny Omega, and if he beat Kenny Omega, he would get a shot at the AEW World Championship. The eighth match is Matt Caster from, um, oh, I forget his tag team name. Matt Caster versus Dante Martin. The ninth match is Ray Lynn versus Abandon, uh, Abaddon. The tenth match is the Powerhouse Paws with Hook with Brandon Cutler. Uh, you know, seeing Hook, and I know he's come from um, the area of Cody Rhodes and training with Cody Rhodes and he's obviously not ready to be a wrestler it's kind of awkward just seeing him follow Team Taz around not doing anything other than having like this mean bugging face all the time um, he hasn't even gotten a chance on the mic and I feel like if you get him somewhere he might be a little more interesting but he's by far the least interesting character that they have just because he doesn't do anything he's literally just standing there he's literally this 17 year old following adults around trying to act cool and it's 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 not doing anything for him. It's not doing anything good or bad. It's just literally just he's there to be there. The following match is Damante versus uh, Lay Layla Gray. Twelfth match is Private Party versus The Butcher and the Blade. Thirteen match is obviously the Matt Seidel versus Michael Nakazawa. This match was made earlier during the show. Kenny Omega comes out after the match and attacks Matt Seidel and then says, you know, this match is starting right now. After the fact... Tony Khan comes out for the first time as an on-screen character, which is something he's publicly stated he does not want to do. It makes Matt Sedell versus Kenny Omega official for next week's Dynamite. I had it written as this week's Dynamite, but I was just mistaken. So it's next week's Dynamite on March 24th, I believe. March 24th or 25th. I forget what Wednesday it is. Um, March 24th. March 24th of um, next Wednesday, which will be. So, he, so if Matt Sedell wins against Kenny Omega... Which I highly doubt he will. He will get a shot at the AEW title. Um, the main event was Mikey Oto versus Rio. I was looking forward to this match just because Mika, M uh, Mika Ito is a talent that I really enjoyed seeing during the Women's Eliminator Tournament. She obviously has the charisma and I'm very glad AEW was so quick to sign her after being requested by a majority of the AEW fan base. Um, she has such great charisma for barely speaking any English. On an American program, which is something really difficult to do, you know, from what we've seen from the from all these other American promotions, Rio was also a great competitor who was my favorite women's wrestler. She was actually my favorite women's wrestler when she first debuted in AEW and when she won the championship. I was hoping she would be a champion for at least a year, but um, yeah, seeing seeing her, she's really great. I really love her style of wrestling. She was trained by Kenny Omega, I believe, for a little bit. So she kind of has that similar hard-hitting, you know, strong style moveset, and it's something I really enjoy seeing from her. Mika Ito was apparently also well known. She was apparently well known for her steel solid headbutts, so she'll literally hit the turnbuckle with her head until her head becomes fucking steel. Basically, I don't know how that's supposed to work. 
Um, during the match, though, you know, as much as I was hyped for it, it was super slow. I have the feeling that it probably would be, considering how the show was meant to be to build up talent, but it's just not all that interesting. It kind of let me down, to be honest. Um, a lot of people were praising the show, like, oh, I really love Dark Eval Elevation, but some of the matches are, you know, it just reminds me of Dark, where, where it's just talent beating up jobbers. It's not really people getting to hone their skills and really getting to showcase and put on work. It's basically just them making the other person look good. And even with this match, it you know, with Mika, Ito, and Rio, it, it doesn't really do much for either of them. And I was kind of disappointed. I, I honestly wouldn't recommend Dark Elevation just yet. You know, it's a new show. It still has to find its, its, its grounding. But as of right now, it's just not something I would continue to watch. Um, Rio does end up winning the match. But like I said, it, it's just something I wouldn't be watching right now just because... Even though it's an AEW product, it doesn't feel like an AEW product. It literally just feels like I'm watching free matches. And, you know, it's I'm getting the quality of what they are. They're free, so they're not going to be very good. They're not going to be very hard-hitting. It's it's pre-taped. So, I, unless they do something different, it's, it's just, for me, it's not the show and kind of wrestling style that I'm looking for. I'm looking for more of seeing what people can do and seeing what they can do with their moveset instead of... Just showing me that hey, this person is here to work, and you know they're they're they can do stuff. But I want to see what other stuff they can do other than the current moves that they have. And watching the show just didn't do much for me. So honestly, like I said, I wouldn't recommend it just yet. I let it find its ground first, but it didn't do much for me as an as a fan of AEW. So anyway, we're gonna take a quick little break. We've been filming here for what 30 minutes already. Jesus. So we're gonna take a quick little break. We'll be right back. It's going to catch my breath for a second. And we'll continue the show with AEW Dynamite's review and the NXT review. So stay tuned. We'll be back in just a few minutes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We are just back for a little break. We are going to review AEW Dynamite and then go on from NXT and just kind of discuss those as well. Anyway, before I get into AEW and NXT, so I really want to talk about just a quick little segment from Impact. Um, from Tuesday. So, I didn't write any notes on the episode, but there was a certain promo that I wanted to talk about, just because I feel like it's very important to the to the wrestling community. So, as we know, Rick Swan, currently the TNA champion and the Impact World champion. Um, you know, if you haven't seen it yet, he defeated Moose um, on Sacrifice, which I didn't get to watch, unfortunately. But he defeated Moose in Sacrifice, uh, during, um, DNA sacrifice and won the match. It become it became unified champion. So, although we've already seen Rick Swan and Kenny Omega, and we've seen Kenny Omega pinned Rick Swan, I feel like Rick Swan now has this heavy weight on his shoulders and isn't getting the recognition he deserves. Now, again, I can't really say much just because I don't watch Impact, but I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a little bit of into detail here. So. Kenny Omega right now is having this gimmick of him collecting the belts, the collector. No longer the cleaner, he's known as the collector. So Kenny Omega is currently the a Triple A World Heavyweight Champion and the current AEW World Heavyweight Champion. Um, he has now wrestled on Impact, AEW, and New Japan. So let's think about this for a second. We also could possibly have him holding the NWA championship belt. Just because AEW has the NWA's association already. So, not only is Kenny Omega going to hold three. I already, I'm already. i saying going to hold because I just know where they're taking the storyline. It's a little predictable. But let's just, get, let's, let's, just, let's just forget the predictability of it for a second. Rick Swan. A, an ex WWE superstar. Many of you might have not known he is a. He used to wrestle on 205 Live, and he was. I believe he he quit, and instead went to Impact. And he is now. He went from being a no nobody to a world champion, unified world champion, Rick Swan. The face of Impact Wrestling, currently, and it's which is currently just getting to its peak, finally in the modern day area of wrestling. And he's going to he's going to main event uh, rebellion against Kenny Omega, possibly the best pro wrestler we've seen ever. And he holds this weight on his shoulders, which is to not only prove that he is the best and he could stand with one of the greatest, 
but also, you know, knowing that he could lose his championships, let's just let's say could, just for the sake of wrestling, knowing that he's going to lose his championships, um, he has to prove just exactly who he is and what he's worth. And unfortunately, while, you know, he is the face and it's going to be embarrassing to know that he lost his championships to another competitor in a different promotion, it's 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 worth saying that Rick Swan, without a doubt, um, is possibly one of the most is going to be one of the most important figures in wrestling. Um, Ray Phoenix obviously was lost the heavyweight champion to Kenny Omega, so he plays an important part in that storyline. Rick Swan plays an important part in this storyline because he's TNA and Impact World Champion. You're not you're not carrying just the current world champion. You're carrying the company's old world champion, which is TNA. So these two belts that Kenny Omega could possibly add onto his collection, Rick Swan currently carries. And while people might just brush him to the side, you need to realize that he's going to stand in the ring of Kenny Omega. And not a lot of people can say that. Not a lot of people can say that. There's only a few that can really go at it with him. And the fact that Wick Swan is being given this opportunity to wrestle with Kenny Omega should say a lot about his character. So I recommend that you guys go check him out and see some of his matches. He is pretty good. I've seen a few of them, actually. And he does very well for himself, especially in Impact. I've seen some of his Impact matches. You know, I've I've had to I have to research on him because he's gonna fight he's gonna fight Kenny Omega, who is again my favorite wrestler of all of uh, right now and somebody that I follow. So I just. You know, you have to give credit where credit's due, and I don't see a lot of people talking about it. I see a lot of people wanting this Kota Ibushi and Kenny Omega match, but, you know, you have to realize that while he has to go through a few obstacles before he can get there, the obstacles that he is going through is going to be historically important because, you know, you're going to have, for the first time, this guy who holds a majority of the American promotion title belts, the more important title belts. And while Impact can be argued that it's not as important as the NWA Championship or the WWE Championship, it, it's going to damn be important because Kenny Omega is going to hold it. Not only the TNA Championship, but he will hold the Impact Championship, which is, I'm telling you right now, it's, it's going to go down in history and it's going to be the most important thing and you have to remember this because you're not going to see this again. And, you know, for the sake of fantasy booking, if Kenny Omega f does somehow end up taking the WWE World Heavyweight Champion and possibly the Universal Champion, it's going to be a sight to see and it's going to be the thing that connects, you know, the wrestling promotions and finally breaks down this literally f forbidden portal that WWE holds and hopefully shows like, hey, you know, every wrestling promotion can work together. You don't need to not talk about people's other accomplishments and not talk about their past work you know you have, you have to really realize the importance of these other wrestling companies in order to understand the importance of wrestling so there's no need to be a corporate giant in a wrestling world that's what i'm trying to say anyway the impact notes for march 17th episode the first the opener of the show is cody rhodes versus penta l zero um, Penta immediately guns after Cody during Cody's entrance, which made me happy because Cody's entrance is always egotistical. I was hoping they would build this feud longer. I was really enjoying Penta's mic skills, considering he's only cut them in Spanish. Um, makes him sound a little bit more intimidating cutting it that way. Um, I hear wrestlers make the comment that when certain spots don't make sense also. So, for example, you know, they don't want to do like big flips and kicks and get to the spot. There's a spot where Cody Rhodes delivers a super kick, a Canadian destroyer, and then a cutter. That right there made, finally made me understand, okay, now I know why people say these spots don't make sense. Because Cody delivers a super kick, Penta gets right back up. Then he delivers a Canadian destroyer, like, okay, he's going to go for the pin. Doesn't stop there. Penta L0 gets right back up, and Cody performs this cutter, and I'm like, you know... He should have been down during the Canadian Destroyer. He literally got up and basically just no-selled the Canadian Destroyer. Um, especially with a pro like Cody Rhodes, I think he knows better. So that's really upsetting me just because you're trying to make yourself look like this big jock and make yourself look good compared to Penta, who a lot, not a lot of people know. And, you know, I was really excited, that, you know, hopefully in, that they would build this feud a little longer because I was like, hey, I missed the style of Lucha Libre and Penta embodies the style of Lucha Libre. Penta beats up, um, Cody then beats up, Cody then beats Penta via a roll-up, 
a fucking roll up. This really upset me. A roll up. He he pins one of the best wrestlers today via a fucking roll up. And one two three beats him clean. Penta then beats up Cody after the match, but Arn Anderson and the Nightmare Family step in to come after Penta. I feel like they did Penta dirty. There's no fucking way you should have lost during a roll up. Now I don't know if there's going to be a rematch in the far future, but I just f- not a fan of the finish. QT Marshall finally comes out and, fi- and confronts the entire after the entire confrontation. Penta leaves to the face tunnel while the Nightmare Family criticizes QT Marshall for showing up late. Um, the following segment is the Young Bucks interview. Don Callis comes out to interrupt the Young Bucks, saying that he's sorry about their father uh, getting beat up by Jericho and MJF, but he also says that the Young Bucks have killed their own careers. Then MJF and his horsemen state will come out. They all exit wearing suits. Tully starts off on the mic and basically he's trying to put over these guys. Now, let's let's just remember here for a second who we have here. So you have this entire group who's basically a prodigy of a faction, ran by one of the greats, Tully Blanchard. So, in this group, you have MJF, possibly the best heel in modern-day wrestling. Literally embodies, protects himself in the business. I can't tell if this guy is legitimately an asshole or not, because he literally acts the way he does in and outside of the ring. I have not seen him you know, behind the curtain. I don't know how he acts, and I love that he keeps up that illusion. Sean Spears, who has some potential, but can do great when put in the correct spot. You know, obviously, with Cody Rhodes. And then, and then you have one of the greatest modern-day tag teams, FTR, who can mix their style of old-school wrestling with any style today. We've seen that with the Young Bucks, or the way the Young Bucks have done their flips and kicks and shit. Um, and then you have the big and bad Warlow. A heavyweight, the, the basically the bouncer of the group, who has still yet to show his potential and see what he can do. We know that he might be the dark horse of the group, but if you haven't seen Warlow, he has amazing mic skills. He has the the move set. He has everything with him. This whole group basically has potential. And then you have Totally Blanchard, the legend who who was part of the legendary Four Horsemen stable. You you can't deny that fact that. This group is literally the embodiment of professional wrestling today. Um, MJF then puts these guys over with a fantastic promo. And keep in mind, he's putting over these ex-WWE guys. Sean Spears, FTR, Tully Blanchard, with the exception of Warlow, who was not a WWE, ex-WWE superstar. He's making it seem like he is the most well-known wrestler of the group, MJF. And is the most experienced and intelligent when obviously he's only been on national TV for over a year. A year. So, um, just seeing what MGF can do now, imagine what he can do in the next five years. It, it's insane. This group's name is no longer the Horseman, by the way, or what I was calling it the Horseman. It's called the Pinnacle. Mm, fan fucking tastic name. Um. Second match we have is John Moxley versus Eddie Kingston versus the Good Brothers. Eddie's immediately attacked by the Good Brothers. Um, I also remember, before this match, I also remember John saying that he wanted to do a tag team after he lost the AEW World World Title. And I guess now Eddie is the tag partner that he was looking for. Um, John Moxley and Eddie Kingston win via roll-up. Kenny Omega comes comes out after the match with a steel chair. The Young Bucks come out actually and stop the chaos after Kenny tries to crush the throat of John Moxley with a steel chair. The Good Brothers throw up the two sweet sign as a sign of solidarity, but the Young Bucks don't want any part of it. Kenny Omega then gets in Matt Jackson's face, saying he's the boss, and basically threatens him. Matt Jackson versus Kenny Omega is a match I had to pay money for. Not something that I thought I wanted, but I definitely won after seeing the, the confrontation they had. Um, the following segment is Tony Schiavone interviews Darby, Allen, and Sting. I was really hoping this thing and Darby partnership was over with, especially that Darby was finally branching out with the match he had at Scorpio Sky. I did not want to see Sting continue to take the spotlight away from future stars. Darby has said he's only defended the title three times, and it's a joke, and he's absolutely right. He has to be a defending champion, and he hasn't really gotten defended it. He's only defending it against Joey Styles. I'm sorry, not Joey Styles. Um, Joey Janela, Brian Cage... And I can't remember the third, um, the third time he defended it. Um, oh, Scorpio Sky. 
So he's won the title back in November, and he's only defended it three times. So January, February, March, April, three times in the four in the span of four months. It's it's embarrassing, considering how many times Cody Rhodes and Brody Lee defended it. Um, Darby gives the Dark Order an open challenge for the TNT Championship. After that, Lance Archer comes out and says Sting is taking away time from him, and cuts a super great promo on Darby, saying if he likes coffins, he'll put one. He'll put one. He'll put him in one. Team Taz comes out yet again, and I was like, God fucking damn it, I don't want to see this rivalry again. I feel like one of the issues that AEW has is when they put their talent in long and dragon feuds, they don't know how to properly end them. So we constantly see the same faces facing each other over and over and over and over and over again. We end up seeing the same match and opponents over again, and I, I don't want to see that. However, Brian Cage kind of surprised me because he cuts a promo on Sting, putting respect on Sting's name, and basically kissing ass and angers the rest of Team Taz and they follow him back into the tunnel. Um, then the Dark Order um, segment comes after that and they accept the open challenge with John Silver accepting the challenge against Darby. Finally, the main event of the show, Britt Baker versus Thunder Rosa, an unsanctioned lights out match. With it being the third AEW lights out match, um, for those who aren't familiar with it, an unsanctioned lights out match means whoever wins, it won't count against their win record, anything gone, anything gone and it's false count anywhere. The only way to win is via pinfall or submission and there must be a winner. This is the first AEW women's main event. This is a rivalry that has been brewing for months. Britt Baker is the future face of AEW and Thunder Rosa is the biggest asset for AEW in the women's division. These two women are possibly the best you will ever see and the best you'll see go at it. So seeing these two, um, turn off my PS5 here. So seeing these two in a match like this, I was super excited to see them. Um, Thunder Rosa performs a dropkick to the ladder. Sorry, I'm reading way far into the notes. Um, this rivalry has been going on for a minute. <laughs> and finally seeing them go at it with each other was something that I was like, oh, you know, this is the second rematch. And they can literally do anything. I know they want to put the women's division on the map. And this match right here was so important to AEW's history just because the women's division is constantly being pushed to the side and finally we get to see a match that's dedicated to the division of the women's roster of AEW um, so uh, if you haven't seen this match go check it out it is the match of the week I believe for my in my opinion um, Britt tries to end the match super early on in the match um, we have seen Hikaru Shida watch this from, from backstage Britt is able to bust open Thunder Rosa very early on. I think this is the first time I've ever seen blood in a women's match with the exception of Britt's broken jaw. Um, so this match starts to get super heavy and super violent really quickly. This is like, how the fuck can these women do this to each other? Thunder Rosa performs a drop kick to a ladder that gone straight to Britt Baker's forehead. Literally, like, bounces off the forehead of, of, of her, like, steel hits the forehead like boom like it's 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 literally like it made me like gasp like oh fuck like she just got hit in the head she knocked out like legitimately um also you know her I, right after this her head is busted open and you can legitimately see the flesh under her blood where it was cut it's a huge cut so these women literally were like we're gonna fucking kill each other Britt Baker then takes out the thumbtacks, and at this point, Britt's, big, Britt's face is just covered red. Like, literally, the blood is in, blood is literally in her eyes. Her eyes are red, and the only thing you could see are her pupils. Thunder Rosa then puts Rebel through the table, and then power bombs Britt Baker into the thumbtacks. Thunder Rosa performs a fire thunder driver to the table outside the ring and picks up the wind, where she gets emotional. And she should, because this match, again, is very important. To not only AEW but women's wrestling, we don't. If you've seen people claim clamoring for women's wrestling and women's main events for years now, and you know finally we're getting some of that in the form of AEW, and hopefully this can lead on to more and more things. We've seen Impact's women's division, we've seen NXT's women's division, possibly the two greatest women divisions in American professional wrestling, and hopefully AEW will now be able to say the same thing. Um, while not as impressive as the John Moxley and Kenny Omega's lights out matches, 
This match definitely met expectations and was extremely violent and was very fun to watch. Um, some of the bumps these women took were insane, so you gotta give them props. Again, possibly the match of the week. It, it was just fucking war, man. And these women really tore it up in the ring in huge respects to Thunder Rosa and Britt Baker. These two are going to be the faces of the AEW's women division. I highly feel like these two should be champion, AEW women's champions super soon. They need to work around the women's division with these two and really build up, you know, uh, build build up their division with these two. It's it's <sighs> while not something they probably want to start off with. You know, it's it's something that you know these everybody cl is claims for these two and everybody really enjoy seeing these two work together. I know I did. I really enjoyed their first match. I'm glad that, you know, they've had this second match, and hopefully their third match could be just as good. Um, that's enough rambling for me. We're going to get into the NXT episode and go from there. So segment, the following, so the opening segment is Finn Balor opening up. It's St. Patrick's Day, and obviously he name drops it, saying he's still the champion. Karen Cross then comes out to confront Finn along with Scarlett, and I've been waiting for this feud for a long time. It's an obvious moneymaker. You have Finn Balor, who was an arrogant, cocky, badass of a champion, and then you have Karen Cross, who is this unstoppable, chaotic beast and undefeated, I might add, until uh, until later tonight. By the way, <laughs> fucking stupid the way he lost. Um. So seeing these two and seeing their different styles, where Finn is more of a strong style, he's going to beat you up and very st has a stiff moveset compared to Karrion Cross's more technical and worn down moveset and MMA style moveset. It's going to be very interesting to see these two go at each other just because they have two very unique sets in their size. So seeing these two and having Finn's character the way it is right now is perfect and if Finn ends up losing the NFC championship you know it, it'd be one hell of a way to go out um Danny Burch and Oni come out to interrupt saying Pete Dunne should be fighting against Finn however Scarlett convinces Danny and Oni to put their tag team titles on the line later tonight later that night against Finn and Carrion so the opening, so the first matchup of the night is Dexter Loomis versus Austin Theory. During the match, Dexter extends his hand to Austin Theory, and then Theory hugs Dexter, who then ties, tries to get him in the sleeper and succeeds, and taps out Austin Theory. The following segment is Adam Cole cutting a promo, saying that he's, um, saying that Kyle O'Reilly cost him the title last week, and says that Kyle is jealous of Adam and his accomplishments, which he should be, because Adam Cole was was the longest reigning defending WWE. NXT champion. Um, also, Adam Cole isn't wearing any Undisputed Era gear anymore. Kyle then appears... Uh, William Regal says Kyle has further damaged his neck and has been banned from the CWC, although Kyle appears on the big screen saying he's gone for... This saying that he is gone for Adam's safety. The third match is Legal Del Fantasma versus Brizango. After the match, Santano Escobar calls out Jordan Devil, Devil saying that he is the true Cruiserweight champion. Um, Jordan Devil then comes out seconds later, and Jordan says that Escobar is falsely claiming that he's the real NXT champion, saying that he doesn't need to jump from behind and he doesn't need to jump from behind and call him out in front of the world, and that he called him out in front of the world. Escobar says that he has redefined what it means to be a cruiserweight champion, and just like Cross and Balor, these two will make a money-making match of the year match. Um, Santo Escobar is right about him redefining the Cruiserweight division. Literally put the, the division on the map for me. I was not a fan of the Cruiserweight title, not a fan of the 205 division, but after seeing some of the work that Escobar has put on and what he does for the roster and what he does for the belt, you know, it's it's insane. He, he has really great charisma, and he can really work on the mic, and he could really show off in the ring, and, you know, he is, while he does have the Lucha Libre style, he's very unique compared to some of the, you know, former Cruiserweight champions that I've seen, and I feel like seeing him in the spotlight that he is right now, he could definitely be a future world champion, and I'm very glad of how careful and how detailed they've been of him, because... While the Cruiserweight Champion is more of a mid-card title in NXT, it's or lower-card title, I guess, because their mid-card is the North American Championship. 
Um, I'm very happy that they're giving the spotlight for these two um, and letting them work, basically. You know, Jordan the Devil is someone I haven't seen much of, but um, shows very high promises for me. While Escobar is somebody who I've been a fan of since his debut, and seeing him put in the work, basically, it's just, it's, it's exciting to see him finally get this little big of a spotlight. Um, Jordan then headbutts Escobar and drops him. Jordan must have hit him for real because Escobar immediately starts bleeding from his jaw, like heavily bleeding. Um, I just cannot wait to see these two go at it, and their match is confirmed for TakeOver. So the fourth match is Tommaso Ciampa versus uh, one of the members of Imperium. Tommaso has attacked Alexander Wolf earlier during the night and has challenged Imperium. Tommaso wins the match, um, and then Walter debuts on NXT with the UK Championship around his waist. Currently, now let me add this really quick, currently he is the longest reigning WWE Champion in modern WWE. He holds the UK title for a... a com uh, sorry, he hold, he's held the UK title for 712 days. 712 days. That's about two years. But 702 days is a very long reign in wrestling days. It's it's basically he's unstoppable, um, including being undefeated since his debut. He's only been pinned once as champion. So and you know with the UK title not being very much a thi a big thing in WWE, it it's very much prestigious, which is by the people who held it. Just because you know Walter makes his debut and immediately goes after the championship and wins it. Walter, Walter challenges Tommaso, but Tommaso is attacked by Imperium, and Walter de Walter delivers a devastating chop to Tommaso. So the following segment is um, Adam Cole has apparently been attacked. William Regal is being interviewed for what happened for what happened between Deville and Santos earlier, when he is alerted by a producer saying something has happened to Adam Cole. Kyle has then been seen being arrested, as well as Adam Cole being arrested, and Adam says that Kyle O'Reilly had tried to run Adam over. Adam is swearing up a major storm, saying that he'll fucking get Kyle O'Reilly, yeah, he's gonna fucking pay, and it's... I was like, damn, like, they're really allowing them to curse on NXT, like, it's a little bit not, uh, it's not very much lenient to the PG side that we see in WWE. So the following match is LA Knight versus a jobber. They literally didn't even show his name. I don't know what his name was. I started laughing because I was like, they don't give a shit about their jobbers anymore. Um, LA Knight finally makes his in-ring debut. His gear choice is a little confusing to me because since his entire color scheme so far has been blue, and he just debuts in red gear, so it's like, uh, are you like, what, what, what the fuck is your character about, bro? Um, LA Knight quickly takes out the jobber with a face slam, and that's all we see of LA Knight. Then the main event, Karrion Cross and Finn Balor versus Only Lurkin and Danny Burch for the NXT Championships. I was kind of glad that Karrion and Finn haven't laid a hand on each other since, you know, going at each other. And I was hoping, yo, know, let them fight at TakeOver, but it didn't happen. I, I always like when we don't get to see the wrestlers fight before a pay-per-view because it just makes me want it that much more. Um, and if I see him fight before, I'm like, well, I've already seen him fight, you know, and then when they, when they see him fight and they're wrestling really slow, it's like, you know, I've seen you guys go at it before. Why go slow if, if you were over here fucking on each other's necks, not letting each other breathe for fucking weeks in and out because you were constantly attacking one another. Um, there's a point where Finn drop kicks Oni into Scarlet and Scarlet literally, le legitimately gone flying. Um, Finn goes to check up on her, and Karrion Cross goes to attack Finn, slamming him into the barricade and, the, and, and into the post of the ring. Oni then pins Finn, and Cross goes straight to attacking Finn and Oni. Scarlet stops Karrion from choking out Finn, and Scarlet goes to Finn and picks him back up, allowing Karrion Cross to uh, attack Finn with a neck to the forearm strike. And so ends the NXT uh, show. And yeah. Those are all the shows we have for this week. You know, I didn't really get to catch up on much. And, you know, it's, this episode's really going... All, this episode has gone long, and I've been kind of stumbling with words. I've just been very busy with school and really paying attention more to school and haven't really been able to sit down and enjoy wrestling this week. Anyway, so my final thoughts on everything. Again, AEW Dark Elevation, something I'm not really um, 
looking forward to right now. It's not really this wrestling show that I would watch. However, it's pretty good so far. If you want to just, if you're there and you want to see more of the talent, kind of the people that you want to see, you want to see more of them. It's it's good if you want to do something for like that. But if you're watching it more to just get another AEW show, it's not what you're gonna look for. It's something that I wouldn't recommend watching, or something that I wouldn't recommend people to watch, especially if um. <coughs> If um, you want to see more of the style that AEW offers, I would just recommend you watch Dynamite. You don't need to follow AEW Dark or AEW Dark Elevation. You'll get the story. Just, you'll get the story very. You will get the gist of the story. I mean, you know, for me being such a big wrestling fan and catching up with all these shows, and for and speaking of somebody who doesn't see Dark or Elevation, um, religiously, I'm still able to understand the stories and such. So they don't add much to the AEW Dynamite show. Um, AEW Dynamite was pretty good. Um, I was, I, I don't. I feel like I was the only one in the minority who felt like the women's match could have been better. But you know, for what it was worth, it was really good, and I felt like it was definitely met expectations. I just kind of wish there was a little bit more chaos. But obviously, you know, these women did what they could with their bodies and did you know what they were able to, what their limit could push them to do. And I respect them for it. You know, same goes for when John Moxley and Kenny Omega had that death match. But, again, I was wishing to see a little bit more. As for NXT, um, kind of a solid show. Not the best show they've had in recent weeks. But definitely they're building up towards TakeOver. And they want to build up very quickly for the, I believe, two more weeks before they have it. So I'm very excited to see how they build towards their next TakeOver. And see what we're, what's in, the, in store for their championships, and especially with their women's championship. I want to see what else they can do with their NXT Tag Team Women's Championships. Anyway, I'm going to end this episode here, and I'm continuing rambling, and I'm very tired and out of the loop. So we're going to end it here. Apologies for having kind of a mixed and not very much prepared episode. Next week, we'll come back very much more prepared. Um, I'm just been all over the place, and I was like, I need to get this episode out. But I think we did pretty good. We did an hour-long so, again, this episode is usually just me talking about stuff and kind of reviewing the shows and getting you, um, I guess, ca caught up on stuff if you haven't really caught up. But, again, I haven't watched Monday Night Raw or SmackDown in a few weeks. So, I need to also catch myself up on wrestling. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching or listening. Uh, again, I will try and put this on Apple Podcasts. I will try to put us on a Google Podcasts pretty soon. If not, though, if you're watching from YouTube, you can watch us on Apple po You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And yeah, hope you guys enjoy this week's episode. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we're gonna get this one quickly edited out, so there won't be too much editing to it. But hope you guys enjoyed. Um, remember to subscribe to us if you can, and I will see you guys next time for an episode of K Fade. Thank you for listening. <laughs>